morning, everyone. My name is Eric O'Connell. I'm the high school and post high pastor here at Hillside Community Church. This morning, we get to con continue in our sermon series uh, through the season of Lent as we examine some of the uh, really important questions that were asked in the week leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, and this is a story, and this is a question. Jesus asked the disciples, are you, uh, are, are you asleep? And it's a question that's asked when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and Jesus is with his disciples, and Jesus is really struggling, right? The text is say, saying that he's actually depressed, and he's actually in his greatest hour of need in his time on earth. Uh, and it's a story that I'm just very deeply um, and profoundly thankful that the gospel writers included, but I'm more thankful that they were just very honest about the state that Jesus was in. Uh, you see, because throughout the majority of church history, uh, the church has affirmed two fundamental truths, that Jesus is 100% God, and he's 100% human. And both of those are important for their own separate reasons, but if you're like me, sometimes you hear that he is 100% human, just like you and me. You go, yeah, but... <laughs> Not really, right? Like, like, yet I understand he had flesh and bones just like me and all that, but he, he also was God, right? He's human with cheat codes. Part of the reason that he could do all the amazing things he did was because he was God. So yes, he is like me, but, but not really. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge, huge Marvel fan. I've seen all the movies, all the TV shows. It would kind of be, sometimes it feels like saying, yeah, you know what? Just like these two, just like Captain America and I'm just like Iron Man. We're the exact same person in every way, shape, and form only I didn't have super soldier serum and I'm not a billionaire genius, but other than those two things, exact same person, it's exactly the same, we're exactly alike. And I think sometimes that this is what we can do with Jesus. We can make him sort of into this impenetrable superhero um, that can never really feel or struggle through the things that, that we feel and we struggle through. But Matthew in this story, and this is why I'm so thankful, does not paint that picture, All right? Matthew shows us, again, a Jesus who's struggling. Again, who's literally depressed, who, who's reached a point that says, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't go on. And, and we've all been there before, right? Um, I, this is a, a point that I don't have to really convince anyone of, especially with the last two years we've been going through. Life is difficult. And, and we've all, at some point or another, gotten to that point where we have just been beaten down, where we, again, it, we, we just feel like we don't have the strength, the stamina, or energy to move forward to go on and especially in these last two years maybe you've either really wanted to or you literally have at one point thrown your arms up and surrender and just said I can't do this anymore I'm done I don't have again any more energy motivation I can't do this I can't experience another heartbreak another setback another failure I can't do this all right Life, life is difficult. We, we, we all are very aware of that, and I'm sure we can all, uh, we could spend the entire morning probably sharing examples. But, but one of the questions we have to ask when we experience those difficulties in life, and this is what our text really addresses this morning, is that in those times of suffering and in times of need, what do we do? Where do we go? Where do we turn to to be able to find the strength to be able to move forward and just put one foot in front of the other? And in this story, what we see through the actions and really words of Jesus is that this story teaches us that in those times of need that we experience, God sustains us through three things, each other, one another, prayer, and his grace. So let's read our scripture this morning, and then we'll talk about this. Matthew 26, 36 through 38, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this story takes place right after the Last Supper, but more specifically, I think Matthew really intentionally places this story after the conversation that Peter has with Jesus at the end of that supper, where he says, I will follow you and I will obey you even to the point of death. And then Jesus says, I, I know that's what you think, but before the rooster crows, you're actually going to de deny even knowing me three times. All right, so this, this story takes place right after that. Um, it's, it's late at night. Um, the disciples have had a very... Uh, tumultuous, probably uh, emotional, very confusing interaction with Jesus. Um, it's late at night again. They've, they've eaten, probably got a little bit of a food coma. I'm um, sure the wine that they had with dinner didn't help, and they've just had an exhausting week, an exhausting day. You got to imagine they're just expecting to pack it in and say, let's all go to bed, get some rest, and take the day on tomorrow. But Jesus says, nope, I need you to get up, and we're going to take a little stroll over to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is about a mile away from where the Last Supper took place. And when they get into this garden, again, very late at night, all very tired, 
we see two scenes really taking place. Matthew paints two uh, pictures for us. We see Jesus constantly interacting with God in prayer multiple times, and then we also see Jesus interacting with his disciples before he's ultimately arrested. And while Jesus is in the garden and having these interactions, there's one singular focus on Jesus' mind, and that is what is about to come, which is his inevitable, his impending death. But there was so much more going on in his mind. In fact, as crazy as it sounds, this might have been really not the least of the worries, but certainly there was a lot more going on that was causing a lot of trouble to Jesus, right? Not only was he going to die, but his friends who he'd spent three years with were all going to betray and abandon him, and some even deny knowing who he was. Uh, He was about to suffer the world's greatest injustice ever, and really feeling like, and practically no one there to defend his, his innocence. He didn't even speak up, right? Uh, he knows he's going to have to go to the cross and experience that, that pain and that anguish of, of physical, literal death. But I think what he would say was so much worse was that in that moment, he was also having to suffer the punishment for all of humanity's sins. Right? He had to be the object. He had to experience God's wrath in that moment. I think you'd say the worst thing, the absolute worst thing that he knew he had to experience was that for the first time in his life, he was going to be separated from the love and presence of the Father. And I think if Jesus were here this morning, he would say, yes, death was very, very hard, (laughs) and none of us look forward to it, but nothing compares to that separation of that love and presence of the Father. That's that's a greater horror, that's a greater sorrow than death itself, right? Jesus was thinking about all of this, and what's, again, so amazing is that Matthew doesn't hide any of this. He lets us have a very, very clear picture and understanding of where Jesus was. He says that he was sorrowful and that he was troubled. Uh, Other translations use different words, which I think are equally appropriate, that he was depressed, literally depressed, deep depression, confused, deep anguish, right? And then Jesus also tells his disciples, again, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's, He's in such a bad spot. He's so confused. He's so beaten down. He's so troubled and so depressed that he's saying, it is killing me. In this very moment, because of everything that's going on, I could die, And Luke even tells us that it was so bad that he was sweating literal blood, which is a literal condition, but it only comes in very intense and overwhelming stress. And and before we uh, dive into the interactions he has with God and his disciples, I think it's just important to take a quick moment to to recognize uh, something very important about seeing Jesus in this state. Right, when we think about the topic of depression and we look at Jesus, I, I don't see it happening as much in Christian circles. And again, maybe the last two years has changed the way we've thought about mental health and faith. Um, but we all have been a part of Christian circles. And there are some Christians in those circles that will say Christians should never get depressed. Just, that's not a thing. I mean, at the end of the day, God's in control, right? Even if you die, you get to go be with Jesus. What's better than that? So, so don't be so down. Just think about Jesus, trust God, and be happy and put a smile on it. Everything will be okay. But again, I think Jesus might be the first person to say, well, that's not true because life is really, really difficult. And, and not only in Jesus' reaction, but in uh, Dale Bruner, who's a theologian, he s- tells us this, is that Jesus' depression in this moment teaches us that in depressing situations, guess what? One faithful response is depression. Right? And we get to see this human element of Jesus really struggling in an area where we don't necessarily think about with Jesus. We don't really couple those two together. And, and, and this is so encouraging because it means that Jesus is truly like one of us. He knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it feels like to get to that point to say, I can't do this anymore. And this is encouraging to us for two reasons, because it ultimately tells us that at the end of the day, hey, it's okay to be a Christian and to be depressed. I know that there's a lot of shame associated with it from a cultural standpoint, but look, if the Lord, the Savior, and the creator of the universe was not above really bad days and really depressive states, neither are we. So it's okay to talk to someone about it, and it's okay to not have shame in that area. But I also understand that's a lot easier said than done, so even if that shame still exists and you're still feeling like no one gets it, no one understands me and I'm all alone, the one little ounce of hope that we can take from this is that, guess what, we're not alone. Even when we feel it, at the, even in those moments where we feel we're at the very lowest rock bottom, guess what? In that garden, Jesus knew what you felt like in that moment, right? We are not alone. So it's just important to recognize that, that if Jesus dealt with this, so are we. 
so yes, life is difficult, it's hard, even Jesus struggles with depression at times, but again, the question we need to ask is how do we face these seasons of suffering and need, right? Where do we go to, where do we turn to, to be able to find the strength, again, to put one foot in front of the other? And the first thing that we see Jesus turn to is his friends, turns to his very close friends. I'm not gonna read the scripture again because we already read it, but just notice, Jesus went with his disciples. He took Peter and the other disciples along with him. And when he, when he was talking to them, he said, stay here and keep watch with me. And, and Matthew, it's really interesting, Matthew's the only gospel writer that tells this story that uses the word with, right? He took his disciples with him. And it seems really insignificant, but I think we need to recognize that, that a lot of the times we understand the importance of Jesus being with us, his presence being with us, and how much we need it. But how often do we consider how much Jesus appreciates our witness, our presence, how much of a gift that is to him, right? He, he needed his friends with him in this moment. And when, what he needed from them was to, what he says is to keep watch. But in the Greek, it literally means stay awake, stay alert. What Jesus is saying is I need you right here. I need you in this moment. Jesus has interacted with his disciples in a lot of different ways. He's taken them to miracles, to healings, to teachings, and you know, they observe, they watch, they learn. Sometimes they needed to be corrected. But in this situation, Jesus says, I need you not to observe, not to watch, not to learn. I need you because I need human companionship. That's what Jesus knew was going to help him in this moment. He needed the help of friends, right? They were his closest friends, the people that knew him better than anyone except for God, people that were in his care circle, his small group, right? And, and he just needed to know that he wasn't alone. He didn't need them to, to try and fix his pain, to try and make sense of his confusion, to, to, to even really say a word or even understand, really. All he needed them to do was just be there with him to pray with him. That's the only talking that he really appreciated was talking to God, praying on his behalf, and just to know that the people who loved him most were there in his time of need offering support. So, of course, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, if, if Jesus, of all people, needed human companionship in his time of need, man, how much more does that, is that something that we need when we're suffering through depression and, and need? Right? And how much more do we need that? If you're struggling right now, if you're about to struggle, if you're going through something difficult, we need to learn to be able to t pick up the phone, sorry, or pick up the phone, text, call, whatever sign you use. Call someone, text someone, reach out to someone and let them know, I'm struggling right now. I need, I need, I just need a friend to be with me. And if you're that friend that is called upon, please don't ever underestimate the, 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 the absolute profound gift just your physical presence is. Right? I'll never forget when my dad died, the, the, the thing that was the biggest blessing to me, but it was so frustrating in the moment, was the pastor who came and didn't answer a single question, didn't try and make it feel better, but just sat there, just sat there with me, cried and said, I'm sorry, I love you, how can I pray for you? Other people at times tried to fix it, tried to take my depression away, tried to do all those things and it made it worse, but the best thing, the best gift in that moment was someone just sitting there and being present, letting me know I wasn't alone. It's, I, I'll never, there's a, a quote that I read when I was at my last church that said, you can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. Your physical presence, man, it is a gift in times of need. Don't ever underestimate that. All right, so that's the first thing Jesus turns to. He turns to his friends, right? But the second thing he turns to, which is the more important thing, is prayer, right? After he gets done talking his, to his disciples, it says that he went a little bit farther and he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, and I say that this one's more important than, than friends, because friends are a good thing, and friends are very important in times of need, but, but even Jesus knew, if friends can offer me support, and they can offer me encouragement and presence, but what I really need right now, and what we really need, is time with the Father. Be because that is where the strength to be able to face these times of need and suffering will actually come from. The, the real sustenance, the real strength to be able to move forward is going to come from God, and it's gonna come in times of prayer. And so Jesus turns to prayer three times, right? And we learn two pretty valuable lessons about prayer as we see him uh, going through these prayers. And the first one is, is pretty simple, and I think we would all say yes, uh, but that it's prayer is essential, right? It's absolutely essential. And, and it's important we talk about this because especially in our, in our world, we're very action and result-oriented, right? And a lot of the times, I think we have the temptation to view prayer as just sort of the warm-up to the real action, 
right? We, we pray before meals or if we're in Christian circles or meetings, we pray, but we don't want to pray too long or too honest because, you know, we, we got to get to the real stuff. And even in this story, you know, we've got the Last Supper, you've, you've got going to the garden, and then that's when it happens. That's when the action takes place. The guards come. Judas betrays him. Peter pulls out a sword, right? That's when the battle is taking place. But again, I think Jesus would say to us, no, 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 that, 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 that's not the case at all. The real action was happening when Jesus was praying. In fact, we, one could even say the, the war was waging, but the battle may have already been won in that moment, in, in that time in, that, that Jesus had with God in prayer. That strength, the, and, and we know that because when Jesus ultimately gets done praying, he's actually not as sorrowful or troubled anymore. When the or guards actually come to arrest him, he's a lot more resolved. Uh, he, he's, he's a man on a mission at that point. He's gentle. He's quiet. He, he knows what needs to be done. But that strength came from prayer, right? Jesus uh, tells his disciples that he prayed for an hour, right? So this wasn't just some religious obligation. This wasn't a box to check. For Jesus, prayer was what actually gave him strength in his time of need to face what he needed to face. And, and again, just like we need friends in difficult times, and if Jesus needed friends, how much more do we need it? If Jesus was able to find strength in prayer to face his most difficult challenge in his life, and that's where he turned to, how, more, how much more do we need to turn to prayer to, to be able to find strength to face the difficult challenges in our lives? All right, so we, we learned that first and foremost, uh, it, it's, it, it's, oh, sorry about that. Um, and goodness gracious, I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, so Jesus reiterates sort of this vital importance in prayer because when he goes back to his disciples, he actually lets them know that's what they need to be doing. He knows what's about to come. He knows he's about to be arrested. He doesn't say, get your weapons, it's time to fight. He doesn't tell them to get in the ground and start strategizing a way to make sure that he can es escape uh, being arrested or escape the cross. He says, no, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Right? So often, in times of stress and need, we try and fix our problems by finding solutions, by, by trying to just push harder and, and work harder. But what Jesus is saying is, no, prayer is so essential. This is what gives you the strength. This is the key to facing your times of need and suffering. I need you to pray, 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 and pray some more. So that's the first thing we learn about prayer is that it's essential. But the second thing that Jesus teaches us about prayer in this story is really what the heart of prayer is all about, which is it's really all about submitting ourselves to God's will. Okay, Jesus didn't turn to prayer so that he could just get something from God. I think for Jesus, what prayer was all about was saying, okay, God, here's my idea, and here's how I think we should approach this. But that prayer was stripping away all those desires and saying, what do you want me to do? And how am I going to find the strength to able, be able to walk in that obedience? Right, and we see that happening in the progression of the prayers that Jesus offers. The first prayer he offers is, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And so he presents a request. God, I don't want to do this. And if there is a plan B, if there's a different way for me to avoid all this, please make it possible. Right? But, but how he ends the prayer is the important part. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Again, it's, that, it's the time he spent, that hour of just learning to say, okay, God, not my plan, not my plan, but your plan, and give me the strength to walk in obedience to that plan. It was essential, and it was about him surrendering his will to God's. So he offers this prayer, and then shortly after, we find out just how essential prayer is and why it's more important than friends, because guess what? Jesus returns to his friends after this prayer, but he finds them sleeping. Right, and he wakes them up. He says, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Right, are, you, are you serious? That's all I ask for you to do is to stay awake and to pray for me. I need you. You need me. We need each other. If you've been listening to anything I've said the past week or at dinner, it's about to get really crazy right now, you guys. Things are going to get really, really difficult. This is not the time to sleep. Get up. Pray, pray some more, stay awake, keep watching. Whatever you do, don't stop praying for me. And whether he was annoyed with the disciples or whether he felt the need to retreat back into prayer, that's exactly what he does. And he goes and he offers his second prayer. He says, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. 
So notice his language changes to, to asking, to, to recognizing. And I think in that first time of prayer, he realized there is no other possible way. This is, God told him and revealed to him, this is the path that we need to take. And what we see Jesus doing is not protesting, not arguing or complaining, but diving further and deeper into submission, obedience, and surrender into what God is calling him to do. May your will be done, not mine. If it can't happen the way I want it to happen, then Father, let's go, let's do it your way, and please, please, please give me the strength. All right, so he keeps coming back to this essential time, keeps surrendering his will, and then he returns back to the disciples, and guess what? He found them sleeping again. All right, found them sleeping because their eyes were so heavy, so he left them and went away once more, and he prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Doesn't even wake him up. Uh, he's asked him, asked them, hey, I need you to stay awake, pray for me, stay alert. They failed him, and he just goes back to the one source and the one person he knows will not fail him in this moment, and that is exactly why prayer is essential during our times of need. And, and again, Matthew doesn't tell us what was actually said. He just says that he went and he prayed the same thing, and so we can only assume that what happened is that Jesus kept saying, okay, God, not what I will, but what you will, and give me the strength to be able to do exactly what you're calling me to do and again, because of how he faced the guards later, we know that this time it, Jesus is ready. He, he knows what has to be done, and he is ready to face it because he got that strength in prayer. So yes, we definitely need friends in our time of need. 100%, we can't do it alone. But guess what? Just like Jesus' friends failed him, so will ours. But even though his friends failed him, he was still able to find that strength to face that difficult challenge because of prayer. That's where he found his strength. But it wasn't even just finding his strength. It was, again, seeing the world through God's eyes. I think that's why it was so essential to Jesus and why that's what he asked the disciples to offer up for him was prayer and not something else because I think Jesus would say that prayer is what really sharpens our spiritual eyes to see what's really happening. Right? That second part of prayer, it's, it's removing the way that we want to see it and seeing it the way that God sees it. Right? And that's why it's so important. That's why it is so essential. And that's why if Jesus is turning to these times, uh, turning to prayer in these times of need and depression, man, we need it so much more. We need our friends and we need prayer. So having found uh, the strength that he needs to face what God is calling him to, he returns to his disciples and once again, he finds them sleeping. And again, we get to see a pretty um, human element of Jesus and the way that he asks them a question. It's pretty ironic and rhetorical. Uh, are you still sleeping and resting? Really, guys? I, I, how many times have I asked you? I, look, it, look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of sinners. I'm ready, you're not. And man, I've got to imagine Jesus, if he really were like us, exactly like us, which he is, but in our worst sinfulness, you've got to imagine this is exactly how Jesus would want to respond. Just put his head down and shake it and say, guys, I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you, this is what I needed, I told you this is what was coming, and now it's here, and you're not ready. And I wonder if he thought about that moment on the Sea of Galilee where the, the waves were crashing and the disciples were fearful that they were about to die and Jesus was sleeping and they said, get up, please help us, we need you. And Jesus got up, calmed the storm and was there for them in that moment. And then this is the time when he really needs them. You've got to imagine, he just wanted to say, I was there for you when you needed me. You couldn't just stay awake for one hour and just pray for me, that's all I needed. I wonder if you wanted to look to Peter and say, you remember that conversation we had two or three hours ago where you said that you would follow me to the point of death? Peter, you can't even stay awake. What makes you think that you've got the moral fortitude and the strength to lay your life down for me? If you can't, if you, if you can't battle sleepiness, it's going to get a lot harder than this, let me tell you. Plain fact of the matter is that the disciples not only failed Jesus, but they, they disobeyed him. They, he, they completely and utterly failed him. They could not stay awake. They couldn't keep watch. They not only failed each other, but they failed Jesus. And look, anyone who's been a Christian for any amount of time knows that as much as we can point the fingers and say bad disciples, guess what? This is also our story a lot of the time. All right? We know what we need to do. We know we need prayer. We know we need other people. We know we need to be there for other people. But man, a lot of the times uh, we find excuses or a lot of the times we just fail. We don't, we don't hit the mark. Right? We want to be that friend that's called upon in someone's hour of need to offer support, but it's easy for us to find excuses or it's really easy for us to mess the entire thing up. 
We want to have vibrant prayer lives. We absolutely want to, but sometimes we just forget. We don't, or we convince ourselves we don't have time. Which is why I think prayer warriors in our midst are really inspiring, but yet very humbling, because it's a reminder of where we want to be sometimes in our prayer life, but also a good reminder of where we have failed to get there. And, and I think that the, same, this, the reason this is our story, just like the disciples, is exactly what Jesus tells the disciples. The Spirit is willing, yes, my intentions are good and pure, and I so badly want to follow Jesus with everything I have, and if my, if my intentions were what drove my action, oh gosh, I would be an all-star at this. But the flesh is weak, right? Our human weakness, our human frailty, and really our pride is what gets in the way, and it destroys our good intentions. But here's the good news, is that although we can imagine Jesus saying these things, feeling these things, and being very, very frustrated, um, he offers the disciples something greater in their failure, and it's what he offers us. Yes, in times of need, we need to turn to our friends, and we need to turn to prayer, and we need to depend on those things. But more than anything else, how do we face seasons of suffering and need is that we depend on God's grace, okay? Uh, J- Jesus sees the soldiers in Judas approaching him. They know what, he knows what's about to come. He knows he has prayed. He knows he's kept watch, and he's alert. He's ready to face the challenge, but he knows the disciples have been sleeping. They haven't been doing what he asked, and he knows that they're about to face a lot more difficulties. We can imagine it would have been within Jesus' right to say, you know what? I'm prepared. You're not. You stay here. I'm going to go on by myself. Catch up on your rest. I got this, you guys. That's not what he says. What he says to them is, rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And in those three little words, but more specifically that middle one, let us go go. I'm not done with you yet. You failed me, but get up. We're doing this together. Come on, guys. Such a simplistic yet profound offer and picture of what forgiveness looks like in our worst moments of failing Jesus. Peter, John, and James, they didn't have time and support for Jesus. The the disciples ran away and abandoned and denied him, and they couldn't give him the time that he asked for, and so often we do the same thing, but God's grace, this is what it looks like, is that when I can't give time or support to Jesus, what Jesus said to the disciples and he says to us is, that's okay, I'm still going to give you my time, and I'm still going to support you. We can run away and deny Jesus, and we can say, you know what, I, I'm going to absolutely abandon him, but it doesn't change the fact that God's heart and God's grace says, guess what, I still give my life for you. And whenever you want to come back, there's open arms. And when we say, I can't be there for you when you need it, I can't offer this obedience, I can't offer myself the way you want me to offer, guess what, Jesus still says, I'm always there for you, just like he said to the disciples. And in those little three words, let us go, is the good news of the gospel, and that Jesus knows that we are weak. He knows that we will fail him over and over again. He knows that we may even deny him, yet amidst all that weakness and failure, which we have it in spades in times of need and in times of suffering, Jesus still says, come on, let's go, let us go. I'm not done with you yet. I still love you. It's not time to just sit here and rest. You need to get up. We're doing this together. And you know what? Sometimes in those moments of need and depression and suffering, what God's grace looks like is quite literally picking us up. Just like Paul says, the spirit, when we can't pray sometimes, prays on our behalf. Sometimes God's grace looks like picking us up and carrying us through that storm and carrying us through that season of need. And in times of great suffering, just as God sustained Jesus through it all, so does Jesus pick us up, wash us of our sins, cleanse us, forgive us, and say, get back out there. I got you. Use my strength. Lean on me, and you will be used. That is what God's grace looks like. And just like Jesus found the strength through his friends, through prayer, and through God's grace, that's what he invites us to retreat to in our times of need and in our times of trouble. So we will try. We'll try again. Guess what? We're going to succeed, but we're going to fail But even when we fail, God's got us. God's grace will be there to pick us up. When we are faithless, he is still faithful. So as we close, I want to remind you of something that we all know, right? We just said this earlier. We all know that we need each other. We all know that we need prayer. We all know that we need God's grace, right? We we, we know those things. I really want to encourage you this week. If you're in a time of need, if you know you're going to be in a time of need, or maybe you don't know, that's often how it happens, or if you're that friend that is going to be called upon to, off, to offer support and help in a time of need, know that one of the best, most life-giving things that we can do 
is to go grab a brother and sister in Christ and say, I need you. I need my family. I need my community. I need you to come around me, support me, and show me love in this moment. Not only that, grab a brother and sister in Christ and ask them to pray. Pray with. Pray for you. Let's go to God together in this because we can't do this alone. And keep doing that. Keep retreating to prayer. Keep retreating to community. And you know what? I hope you have success, but guess what? Even if we fail, God's grace will continue to sustain us. We know we need these things, so brothers and sisters, in our times of need, let us remember to constantly be retreating back to one another, to prayer, but more than anything, depending on God's grace, because that is what will sustain us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are like one of us. God, that you feel our worst pain, you feel our greatest heartbreak. Uh, God, and that you get it, you understand. Lord, may we be able to lean more and more uh, on that grace that you give us. God, may we be able to retreat to you in prayer to find strength to get through our times of need. And God, may we be good brothers and sisters in Christ to one another. God, more than anything, we just thank you. that you were able to give that example and show us that even as we walk through the greatest valleys of suffering, God, it can produce some amazing results for your namesake and for your kingdom. And so God, sustain us, continue to sustain us through one another, through prayer and your grace. And God, may our, our, our church family here just be a vibrant expression of what it looks like to follow you radically with obedience, even in our times of need. Sustain us, Lord, but thank you so much for your love and thank you for the example Jesus gives us. In your name we pray, amen.